Got another difficult story to read tonight. These stories are kind of buried in the Bible that we don't usually learn about them in Sunday school. They're not usually preached on, but they're in the Bible, and so we need to hear what they have to say. Even the unpleasant stories are in the Bible for a reason, and somehow we need to glean something from them what God is telling us. Numbers chapter 31 is what we're looking at tonight. I'm going to read verses 1 through 20. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. You shall send a thousand from each of the tribes of Israel to the war. So there were provided out of the thousands of Israel a thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand from each tribe, together with Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest, with the vessels of the sanctuary and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. They warred against Midian, As the Lord commanded Moses, and killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechim, Zer, Hur, and Rebi, the five kings of Midian. And they also killed Balaam, the son of Baor, with the sword. And the people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones. And they took as plunder all their cattle, their flocks, and all their goods. All their cities and the places where they lived, and all their encampments, they burned with fire, and took all the spoil and all the plunder, both of man and of beast. Then they brought the captives and the plunder and the spoil to Moses and to Eleazar the priest, and to the congregation of the people of Israel at the camp on the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the chiefs of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. And Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds, who had come from the service in the war. Moses said to them, Have you let all the women live? Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones, and every woman who has not who has known a man by lying with him. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him keep alive for yourselves. And camp outside the camp seven days. Whoever of you has killed any person and whoever has touched any slain, purify yourselves and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. You shall purify every garment, every article of skin, all work of goat's hair, and every article of wood." There's some background to this story. The Midianites, along with the Moabites, they had sent their women into the Israelite camp, and uh, these women had seduced some of the men who then went and worshipped Baal uh, among the Moabites and the Midianites. And so there was this massive plague among Israel because of that, and many people died from that plague. And so, this is kind of the aftermath of that. It says in there that they killed Balaam, son of Beor. He was the one who actually put them up to it. It says, if you want to bring down this nation, this is what you have to do. You've got to get, separate them from their God. So, here's how to do it. And so, they took his advice and Israel was seduced into idolatry. And so, this is kind of the aftermath of that. This is a disturbing story, especially to our ears. First of all, this is a violent attack for the sake of vengeance, it says. Jesus taught, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus practiced 
the opposite of this. He didn't defend himself or resist arrest at Gethsemane. And when he was on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. So this being a violent attack for the sake of vengeance kind of is conflicting with this. It says that everyone was killed, even women and children. Verse 7, it says, They warred against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every male. And then Moses later says, Kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known a man by lying with him. And this is kind of disturbing, especially since women and children are not combatants or anything. And Jesus especially valued children. It says that they were even bringing babies and infants to him that he might touch them. And he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So there's a conflict there. And then the young women were forced to marry men who killed their people, maybe even their own families. Kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him keep alive for yourselves. So all of these young girls were forced to marry men who had killed their people, maybe even their own families. And maybe the worst part about all of this is that this was done at God's command. This wasn't, we can't just chalk this up to human beings not knowing what God's will is. It was done at God's command. Now, it is noteworthy that God only commands them to attack. He doesn't give details about that attack. But it is also noteworthy that it says they warred against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses. And God does not command them to show restraint. God does not intervene to stop them from committing what, what these atrocities, nor does he rebuke them after they do so. So, there's some stark discrepancy here between these parts of the Bible, this story here and things that Jesus said and taught. And it even goes against all common notions of human decency. And it's interesting to watch how different commentators will try to explain this. So, John Calvin, this is what he says, The anger of Moses might appear to us inhumane when he severely reproves his soldiers because they had not treated the female sex with the greatest cruelty. But it is not our business to canvass the judgments of God, before whose tribunal we must all hereafter stand. Although, therefore, there may be, they may be repugnant to our own feelings, still we must rest assured that even where they may seem to be excessive, he nevertheless tempers the most severe punishments with the most perfect equity. It is not our part to murmur against him lest he should absolve himself by condemning our blasphemous audacity and temerity. That was him on his commentary on this. And more liberal scholars of the day will explain it in other ways too. It says, from one guy, it says, even a casual reader of the Bible notices that between the alleged divine endorsement of genocide in the conquest of Canaan and Jesus' call for love of enemies in his Sermon on the Mount, Something has clearly changed. What has changed is not God, but the degree to which humanity has attained an understanding of the true nature of God. In other words, there's kind of this evolution of understanding of God. But what that kind of overlooks is that God commanded this. So how do we make, make sense of this? This is, this is a troubling passage. And it's... It's difficult to understand this. But before we try to make sense of this, I want to make some things abundantly clear here. Number one, there is no room for vengeance in the Christian life. We are not to take vengeance. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. 
And we are to even love our enemies. Christ is very explicit about this. We are to forgive our brothers and our enemies 70 times 7, Jesus even said. And we are to overcome evil with good. And this is a recurring theme throughout Jesus' teachings as well as the rest of the apostles. So, vengeance is not, is not ours. Number two, evil is the cause of all wars, even the just ones. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that all war is unjustified and all self-defense is unjustified, but evil is the cause of all of this, even in the quote-unquote best of circumstances. When violence is necessary, the reason is always evil. Evil is always the problem. So most wars are about seizing or controlling wealth or resources or land. Most wars would probably be classified as unjustified, the ones that are all throughout history. And even when there are some very justifiable wars, take World War II, for example, where there was some very cruel tyranny that was trying to take over the world, uh, war is still a horrible thing, even when it is very justified. It's never something to relish. So evil is always the cause of it. And number three, all human life is in God's image and it has inherent value. It has inherent value. So even when war is just and necessary, the loss of life is always tragic because human beings are dying. And even when war is justified or self-defense is justified, it's still a tragedy because someone in the image of God loses their life. So the reasons, for example, that Christians are against abortion are the same reasons why we should care about human lives anywhere of any time. Even people who are very different from us and have very different practices People who even believe differently than us and aren't even Christians at all. They are made in the image of God. They are human beings. And we need to care about them and value them as image bearers of God. So like right now, for example, there's Rohingya Muslims that are fleeing Myanmar because Myanmar doesn't like them. And uh, they are being exterminated. And they're fleeing into neighboring Bangladesh where they're not wanted there either. And we need to care about people simply because they're made in God's image, not because of our affinity with them. Human life has inherent value, and that's why any unborn baby that's aborted is wrong. Number four, massacres in the Old Testament are never a reason for genocide today. We cannot use these examples of massacres in the Old Testament to try to justify any massacres today. These are very different times under very different circumstances. And I say that because Christians have used these sort of massacres to justify massacres in recent times. And I found this story about some English people in Connecticut who wanted to take over some land by some Native Americans, a Pequot tribe, for example, and they just wanted the land. And so they formed this war party and they invaded, and it says that they set fire to all the wigwams there and burned everybody to death. And uh, they justified it by using the Old Testament massacres. In fact, one of them even wrote it this way. Thus was God seen in the mount, crushing his proud enemies and the enemies of his people, burning them up in the fire of his wrath, and dunging the ground with their flesh. It was the Lord's doings, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We are never to use what happened back then as justification for our political or selfish ends today. Massacres back then do not justify massacres now. So, those things 
being hopefully abundantly clear, let's try to understand what's going on here. As I was studying for this, I uh, put, took out a book that talked about warfare in nation states versus warfare among primitive traditional tribes. And that was very helpful in understanding what's actually going on here. Israel and Midian were not nation states, but tribes at war here. It says that Midian had five kings. That means they had no centralized government. They had five rulers. So they had five chiefs of sorts. This was not a one king state. And Israel doesn't have a one king state. Moses is a prophet. He is a leader. But there are 12 tribes among the people of Israel. And so they had no centralized government either. They had no standing army. They had to recruit a thousand from each tribe. So, this is tribes at war. This is not nation states at war. So this is a very different time and place. And there are still some primitive tribes that can have been studied that are still around today in like New Guinea and South America and other places. And so when they studied these, these primitive traditional tribes, they learned quite a bit about how tribal warfare works. And tribal warfare kind of has patterns to it that are very similar to the way warfare is waged in the Old Testament. Tribal warfare is very different from state warfare. We live in nation states. Almost, well, every country in the world is a nation state. There are large groups of people with centralized government, and it's well organized and well established. Nation states um, have large groups of population. Tribes have a small population, and they're very loosely organized, and organized into clans of sorts. State warfare, when warfare is waged today, is limited, whereas tribes engage in total warfare. So states, for example, they have standing professional armies. Tribes mobilize all the men that they can at a given time when it's time for war. So their fighters are non-professionals, they're farmers, they're hunters, they're herders. And war, even though they're using all of the men that they can find, involves the whole population. So there's always a bunch of women and children who are in supporting roles. Everybody is in a supporting role of some kind because you need all of the help that you can get when you're a tribe at war. So tribes are totally engaged in warfare, whereas states like us, we have limited warfare. State warfare is temporary, Tribal warfare is chronic. It doesn't stop. It's ongoing. So, it's constantly, you're constantly at war with neighboring tribes. Boys are trained from childhood to fight and expect attack. Revenge plays a dominant role in the cycles of violence. So, not unlike here. So, when one person is killed here, there always needs to be some sort of retribution so that this tribe doesn't overtake you. So there's always this tit-for-tat of killing. And there are frequent ambushes and open battles, not with many deaths, but they are occasionally punctuated by massacres that exterminate whole populations. This is common in tribal warfare. State warfare ends with peace agreements. Tribal warfare only ends with extermination. You are constantly at war with your neighboring tribes until one of you is gone. So states have centralized decision-making and negotiators. Tribes lack centralized leadership and everybody has a say. And because of that, Individuals who are dissatisfied with any agreement of peace will eventually be hot-headed enough to start 
the war again, and this will go back and forth again. So tribes don't really can't successfully organize peace agreements. If you're a hothead in a state that made a peace agreement and you don't like it, the state has a centralized role to hold you in check or punish you if you should try to engage in any more warfare. Traditional armies do not take prisoners because they are unable to guard them or feed them or make use of them. War's goal is to take over the enemy land and exterminate the enemy of both sexes and all ages. That's warfare's goal in a tribe. So there is intentional killing of civilian women and children with villages burned and pillaged because everyone is a combatant in a tribal war. And the war only ends when one of you is totally defeated. One of you eventually will be totally defeated. Who is it going to be? So these are just a few things that I took away. This is what tribal warfare is like. When you're a tribe, this is how you engage in war. So Numbers 31 describes a common end of a tribal war. If you read the rest of this chapter, it doesn't spend a lot of time on this war or this conflict. It spends a ton of time on how the spoils are divided and how they give part of it to God. This was the significant part of this war, how the spoils were divided. The war, that was common. This is normal. Instead of being extinguished by the enemy, we extinguish them. This is how it works. The Midianites, by the way, were not actually eliminated as a people. These local Midianites were, but the Midianites come back in full force back in Judges and later. So it's these local Midianites that they are talking about. But in a tribal war, warfare scenario, this is a very vicious environment. This is kill or be killed. This is... You exterminate them, or you are exterminated. One of you is going to survive, and one of you is not. Before Christ came, life was about survival in a sinful world. All you cared about was surviving. This is a sinful world where war is necessary, and because there's going to be war, you had to engage in it, and you had to win or you are going to be exterminated. Survival is kind of a common priority throughout the Old Testament. You're constantly worried about if you are going to survive or not, if your family is going to survive or not, if you're going to have any legacy for anyone. But Christ has come, and now everything has changed. Because Christ has freed us from the sinful ways of the world. We are free from this kill or be killed way of the world. So this discrepancy that we have in the Bible is between surviving in sin versus being redeemed from sin. In John 1.17 it says, The law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. They had law back then. And they had a future hope of salvation. But that was not fully realized. And so now that Christ has come, we have grace and truth and so we are redeemed. In Romans 6.14 it says, Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. We live by a whole different order now that Christ has come. Christ has defeated death and extermination is no longer a threat to us. We don't have to worry about that. Theoretically, even if we were exterminated, we know that because Christ has defeated death, we are going to rise again. Death is no longer something that we need to fear. So, we don't play by sin's rules of kill or be killed. We don't have to follow those rules anymore because Christ has defeated death. In Hebrews 2, 
it says in verse 9, we see him who is for a little while made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So he tasted death for everyone. He defeated death for everyone. And since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Before Christ came, we were held in slavery by the fear of death. Now that Christ has conquered death, we don't have to fear it anymore. Survival is not our top priority anymore. We have bigger things now. And so now, we obey Christ, not fearing death or caving to sin. Sin has been defeated. Death has been defeated. We have a new Lord. Our priority is not avoiding death. It's not following our instincts. It's not survival. It's not honor. It's not vengeance. Before Christ came, this was the way of the world, surviving in sin. Now that Christ has come, we have a whole new outlook on things. We have a whole new set of priorities. Numbers 31 shows us what Christ has actually freed us from. This is the way of the world. This is the way of sin. This is what Christ has saved us from by conquering death. And thank God that he has. So while this was normal back then, this is no longer normal anymore. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our God, our Father, there's... There's parts of the Bible that are difficult to understand and, Lord, they certainly rub us the wrong way, at least. We are th so thankful for Jesus Christ who has given us a whole new outlook on life, given us a whole new set of priorities so that, Lord, we don't have to play by these rules of survival and kill or be killed and that, Lord, we can focus on you and eternal things of heavenly value. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.